Hello, I'm Chris Anderson, sitting in for Jordan Davis at the Progress Breakfast Roundtable. Uh, I'm sitting here from my right with Becky Witchers from the school district, Mike McGrory, Jerry Reedy, and Angie Johnson from Unity Point. Uh, we all just got done with the school district's annual Progress Breakfast, where we learned about a lot of the great things going on the, at the district and where they're headed next. So what we wanted to do is take a few minutes, and uh, for those of you that weren't able to be there, kind of go through some of the highlights of the morning and uh, some of their individual thoughts on where we're headed next. So uh, one of the things uh, that stuck out with me uh, as we think about our community and some of the things that we uh, really need to address, and one of the ways the school district has partnered with another organization is the partnership with Unity Point on the community navigators. Um, Angie, I think that's something that um, has been in the works for a long time. Um, and if I understood correctly, we've just gone from two to three, or we're about to go from two to three. Um, could you kind of take a second and talk to us about what that Community Navigator program is as an overview, um, how it kind of came to be, and how it helps the community as a whole, including the district? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, it's a great partnership um, to be able to provide those resource navigators in the school. We really look at the opportunity. We have a phenomenal school district with great educators, and we want to allow them to be able to meet their mission and vision, and that's educating their kiddos each and every day. Where in healthcare, our goal is to provide health and improve the health of our, the communities we serve. So this is an opportunity for to take the subject matter experts and place them and connect them, those resources with the kiddos. Um, there are one in each of the middle schools and now one in the high school. It has been a success. Our resource navigators partner throughout the community, whether it's the food pantry or it's the um, you know, MCSA, if there's shelter concerns. Um, they also connect kiddos with primary care providers so that they're getting the health care that they need. Um, and it really allows the um, resource navigators to work with families and kiddos and um, connect them with the resources that they need. So is this, uh, and I don't know who would be the best one to answer this from you guys, um, how is this, is this a self-selection thing where people come forward? Do you have some criteria that helps identify uh, kids and families you might make sure that a navigator gets in contact with? Well, it, it, there's, uh, it's all of the above. Uh, uh, we certainly have uh, families or students that may reach out for that assistance. We also have teams in each building that, that uh, work with uh, kids that are showing um, signs that they may, may have some at-risk uh, issues in their life. And so uh, we're, we're working to try and, and be um, uh, preemptive in that and making sure they get connected to those resources. Um, I thought Angie really hit on an, an important point, and this, this is a partnership. And, by having this connecting link in school where uh, so many of our families are connected with us, we can really help all these other organizations be more effective and efficient in getting those resources and help uh, out to, to folks. So, um, you know, this is, this is really something that um, I think the entire community can be uh, proud of, but really, more importantly, it is one of those things that's going to help so many of our families and our kids be successful. That's awesome, and that's, you know, one thing as, you know, we some of us look at it from the outside i love seeing the two organizations here bring in the others as well so that everybody's using their resources to the best of their ability and that's i think what makes this such a strong collaboration and a great story so i guess the next question is where do we go from here so you know we've got resource navigators there what's the next step in this service vertical look like angie do you have any ideas on Maybe where we go next? Well, there's a partnership, so my friend next to me has to be in agreement <laughs> as well. I think uh, yeah. you know, mental health services is one that we see a continued need in our community. I would say that we've made huge progress with the opening of Robert Young Center at 1616 Cedar. We have mental health services at the MCSA building and then within our clinics and hospital along with uh, telepsych in the ED. So a lot of great progress. However, we know, as Dr. Reedy talked about earlier today, in that early childhood stage and earlier in life, mental health services are a need for our kiddos. And the sooner that we can connect those services with them will help their future, help them be able to be in the classroom to get that education, help them be learn the tools that they need to be successful in life. 
And so we are looking at partnership opportunities to be able to offer that mental health services in ways that it'll be sustainable, which I think is our key right now. Um, you know, we're a very fortunate community to receive grant funding or independent funding for services, but I think Dr. Reby and I are both on the same page that whatever we offer, we want it to be sustainable to the future. And um, that sustainability is what we're looking at right now. There's a few models that we're investigating and we're working with local, legis or local and state legislative to be able to offer those. So we're continue to work on that. Yeah, we certainly don't feel like we have to own the solution. Right. We want to be right. we want to be uh, part of the solution, uh, partner with with that. So, you know, if the service is in our school, if the service is outside of our school, and we help connect kids to those, the important thing is kids and families getting the services, not where they get the yeah, service exactly. or who's delivering it. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, we we have some other partners that we're also working with with this and in, uh, in this area and. Um, you know, Mike can probably talk a little bit about uh, ab ab about that. Some other sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're yeah. Besides Trinity, um, we have some other exciting partnerships. Uh, one we started this year was um, Vera French, where we have contracted with them to bring in two therapists uh, at the elementary level, because based on uh, the feedback we were getting um, from our resource navigators was. Uh, a lot of positive feedback that uh, it was really making a difference and we were really identifying and helping kids and their feedback to uh, the district was we really see a need for more therapists um, at the elementary level and so we took that feedback and, and started to work with Vera French and uh, they currently do it for all the Davenport schools uh, put therapists in each one of their elementary schools so they already had a model in place uh, it's been a good partnership for us I think one of the things we mentioned too today that um, internally what we've done too is is increased our s social emotional supports by adding a lot of guidance counselors. We've gone from 11 guidance counselors to 17 guidance counselors in our district in the last couple of years. So we're trying to do some things internally uh, based on the need, our me uh, not just the mental health needs, but just the social emotional needs of our students. Um, and then also like Jerry said, bringing in external resources too to help with that as well. So. Well, and, and I think, you know, as I try and step back and look at the big picture of everything you guys talk about, you know, it, we talk about increasing the rigor of the curriculum. Um, I know Becky's talked a lot about that. I know Mike, you do. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about having uh, a great experience for the kids all the way around. And so one of the things that I think this allows us to do is make sure that the kids are ready to absorb that curriculum when they walk in the door. Because as I, you know, sometimes I think about, okay, well, I hear you guys talk and I'm like, okay, well, what does that really mean, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that look like for an individual student? And the one thing I, I think back to my time at Flickinger and I remember uh, like it was yesterday, this one young girl who come in after school to the after school program and was sleeping on one of the pews in the hallway. And, you know, I was just kind of wandering around and, you know, kind of keeping an eye on things. And I was talking to one of the workers that works with her very closely. And I was just, you know, okay, if she's tired, kids need rest, cool. But I was just kind of curious. She's like, oh, yeah, she comes in every day and takes a nap because when she is at home overnight, she had a, uh, I believe it was like a two-year-old little brother who she would be the one responsible for getting up and changing the diapers. Now, this was like a seven-year-old first grader who was... Yeah, somewhere along that line. And, you know, these are challenges that are completely foreign to me. You know, like a seven-year-old being responsible for their younger sibling. And, you know, these are the things that, how would she even be thinking about reading while she's tired and having been thought about her little brother all night? And so what I love about this is we're taking the whole person. You know, we're supporting whatever they need and getting them ready for the advanced curriculum that they're going to need in the future. So I think, I feel like we've got a good handle on where to head with that. So, you know, I guess um, from a curriculum standpoint and where we go on academic achievement, what's next there? I mean, I know we've talked about AP a lot. We've talked about um, things like that. What, Mike, could you maybe speak to a little bit about the AP program and sure. how that integrates with all the other curriculum? Sure. Yeah. We. We, in, in our progress breakfast, we, we spent some time kind of updating our community on what, what are we currently offering in the way of AP and then also uh, 
what do we what foundation we're trying to build to ensure our students are prepared for AP. So one of the things we've added uh, the last couple of years is a pre-AP um, courses uh, going from fifth grade through 11th grade. And what I think has amazed everyone in our district is how much our students have embraced those opportunities. Um, uh, the results we're seeing, um, pro I, for me, it exceeds what I thought as quickly, I can't believe we've gotten there as quickly as we have. Uh, some examples are, um, we went from not being even uh, placing an AP, and now we're one of the top AP schools in just, you know, in less than five years. Um, but on top of that, what's really important is student ha students having success. And so uh, what our statistics show is that they're not only taking more rigorous courses, they're having a lot of success as well. And so their scores are, are some of the highest we've had in the last five years. Um, we're right there at the state average and scores. And so we're really proud of our kids because uh, what we're seeing already in pre-AP is the number of students taking those rigorous courses have increased dramatically even, even the last two years. So like the fifth graders that took uh, pre-AP last year, there's a lot more now that are in sixth grade that are taking pre-AP. So I think our students are really buying into the concept that this will help us not only in high school, but it's gonna really help us for our future. And I, I've come to realize that students oftentimes and parents oftentimes respond to these opportunities. They may not know about them, but if they're presented and available, they will they will definitely take advantage of them. And that's what we're seeing right now. Okay. And that's, you know, one thing you talk about pre-AP classes in sixth grade, I remember you know, I'm not that <laughs> old, but I remember we didn't even start talking about that stuff till eighth grade, right. ninth grade. You know what I mean? Like that was, um, you know, you were taking uh, algebra in eighth grade, I think is, or no. Ninth, probably. Eighth grade, ninth. No, I think we started in oh, eighth, so you? that you could take AP Calc in your senior year. Oh, yeah. It was, it was something take, like that. Yeah. I remember eighth grade, we had to start yeah. planning if we wanted to take AP yeah. Calc. And you're talking sixth grade. So, right. you know, I think that shows, and, you know, I think about watching my son Wyatt, who's a first grader now you know, the curriculum that he's doing is so much tougher at first grade than what I remember doing. Now, mm -hmm. I, I could have different glasses on now, but <laughs> holy cow. Probably bifocals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I need them. Yeah. Well, and I think the, the content, uh, the rigor of the content is important, but maybe even more important than that is that we are getting kids that see themselves as confident learners. And in today's uh, marketplace, as we're trying to prepare kids to be um, uh, the workforce tomorrow, you're going to have to have people that continually can learn and have the confidence that they can learn. And what we're seeing, uh, regardless of the school, we have certainly some of our higher uh, poverty schools, we're seeing a tremendous amount of uh, kids taking these AP courses. And what's more important to me than the scores are the fact that you have kids saying, you know, I'm really confident I can do this. I have great hope that I can do more in the future. I want to do more in the future. Uh, that really speaks well for uh, for what what's happening with these. So, it's uh, it's a multi front uh, uh, avenue that we're that we're approaching with this. And I and I think I really take to take my hat off the teachers that are that are taking this on and uh, not only challenging kids but challenging themselves because this is rigorous. <laughs> and uh, it's not only, uh, it, it, you know, they, they're, they're having to learn some new skills, and that's, uh, that's a good thing for our schools and for our community, and particularly our kids. Yeah, you know, I will say, Becky, this something you had, could you guys slide the mic down for it? Sure. Uh, you know, upstairs in the breakfast just a little bit ago, uh, Becky led us in a little bit of a... Um, Are you smarter than a fifth grade student that's currently enrolled in our yeah, math yes yeah and How'd uh, you do? uh well i was busy <laughs> at the moment i did see i did see a uh, division equation that had a couple of fractions in it. and i felt confident i could have got it had i sat down sure it might have taken no i think a pen and paper i would have gotten there um but the scared faces in that audience i think said it all so could you kind of talk about the background on why you use that as a tool and what it represented? Well, I think it's good to communicate with the public on what is actually going on in our classrooms. Um, you know, our, our buildings are open for anyone to stop in, but very rarely do we get people coming in and sitting in a fifth grade math lesson, let alone a first grade reading mm -hmm. lesson. So it's always good to, to show people this is what our kids are doing on a regular basis. 
Um, and it was fun to see them squirm because it, not a lot of hands were up there. Yeah, I was definitely glad I wasn't sitting down with the pen and paper because right. yeah. I would have been squirming. I would have gotten there. I would have struggled. Well, the neat thing is, too, you know, we have we have options. We have choices. Um, and, and, and hopefully that, that theme was, you know, carried through this morning. And we have uh, curriculum choices as well. So currently our, our elementary uses Journeys, which is by Hardcore uh, Publications. And as, as you talked about a little bit with your son, that's, that's our ELA curriculum for elementary. Um, it's, it has uh, opportunities for learning and strategies. It's based on 120 minutes of day, so kids are getting direct instruction. They're getting small group instruction. Um, a lot of resources and strategies for teachers to implement in the classroom. Uh, middle school uses um, their ELA curriculum is called Collections. And uh, it is uh, challenging as well. Uh, that just happened two years ago. And this year, we embarked on STEM Scopes, which is our new science curriculum. And that is aligned with the NGSS standards, which is this national science standards. And that's been a great discovery. Teachers just started teaching the science curriculum when um, we entered back in August. So we have curriculum is, is there. Teachers um, feel comfortable with it, and they feel confident confident with it, and um, it's allowing our students to take a hold of this too. One thing that I hear out in the community, and I think what you just said actually addresses this really well, is there's always kind of this conversation about uh, is it better to have a set curriculum or let a teacher mm -hmm. kind of tailor it for the student? Mm -hmm. And what I love that I hear about this is the answer is not either or; it's both. It's mm -hmm have some curriculum and give the teachers the tools to apply it for each individual student. And that sure seems like the winning equation there. Absolutely. I mean, it's not this or this, it's and. Um, and having been in the classroom for 16 years, uh, I did not know everything, so if I had to create all of this on my own, there would be gaps. So uh, teachers need resources um, that do the work for them, and then they have options to pick and choose and select based on the content that they're covering, the standards, um, how in depth they need to be, and also, um, you know, they, their instruction is guided by their students. So, you know, I I think there was a lot of great stuff, and down the road, uh, the Progress Breakfast will be available for people to watch. Uh, but I think, you know, now would be a great time to hear from each one of you guys uh, as we kind of wrap up here. What would be the one thing that you want the community or anybody looking to move to this community? to know about the community and the district and you know something that's maybe not known but should be. Jerry, do you have? Yeah, you know, uh, and, and that, that's something of an easy question for me because I'm so proud of this school district and proud of the people that work here. But you know, it, uh, no matter uh, where you come from or what you would like your child to have experience in in Muscatine, we can provide it. If you're, if you're looking for a fine arts experience, you could not find a better place to be than Muscatine. If you're looking for a wide array of other activities from athletics to, to clubs, we have them. If you're looking for a strong pre-college uh, prep curriculum that will allow your student to be prepared for any level of, of a four-year degree from elite schools to, to others, Muscatine's a place to be. If you're looking for a place where your child can learn some career skills that would allow them to enter the world of work or to be trained in a vocational area, we're the place to be. Um, so we really do have a wide array of opportunities for our kids, uh, and I think we're really good at all of them. Can we be better? Yes. Are we going to get better? Yes. Is there anybody that, that I say is doing a better program than us? I would like to see who they are. Okay. Mike? Yeah, the thing I might add to what Jerry said, Chris, is that um, I, I would say one, one of the things uh, that I, as a district we're very proud of is that we have taken the latest research out there and what I would call we're cutting edge as a district. You know, we named up a lot of things uh, at the breakfast that we are doing the first, either doing first in the state or just a handful of school districts are doing, you know, for example, requiring and paying for the ACT paying for all of our AP exams for our students so we can ensure that all students have access to that curriculum. Um, and it kind of goes on and on. And once you start putting it all together, you start seeing that our district really is on the rise. Uh, 
we're willing to commit the resources that is, are necessary for a kid to be successful, and um, and that's an exciting place to work and, and be. In, so, well, and I think too. I think, you know, on the heart piece, uh, this year uh, we embarked on something a little bit different. We had Muskie visits where our teachers connected with our parents to say hi my name is so and so we're excited for your child to come to school this is a little bit about the school that your you know son or daughter will be attending do you have any questions um, that's to me customer service and not every district does that yeah. and our teachers our staff are excited to go out and meet the people and make relationships and I think all of this is is, is tied the key is relationships um, teachers building relationships with students and then beyond the classroom with our parents and grandparents. We have a lot of people that are out there um, helping our kids get ready for school every day and our teachers and staff want to connect with them. Awesome. Well guys again we're wrapping up from the progress breakfast here. Jerry, Mike, Becky thanks for hanging out with us yeah, here for yeah. a little bit. Thanks for having and, us. And uh, you'll be able to watch the full progress breakfast at some point. Uh, it'll make it out on social media and We'll, we'll get that out for you, but thanks for tuning in and keep watching Voice of Muscatine.